You won't grow it. You'll just kind of stay the same. You may not, you may not backslide. You may, you're not going to grow it. You're just going to kind of stay in the middle. And here's the thing. If you don't get connected, our church will stay the same. And our church won't go further. And our church won't go higher. And our church won't make a bigger difference. Listen, we won't be able to do the things that God has called us to do. It really does. It takes every part of the body. What does it take? It takes every part of the body getting connected and doing their part and operating as a unit to make a greater difference. It's our goal. It's our passion as a church, as, as your pastor, to get you connected. And the reason being is so that we can reach more people that are far from God. Amen? So make sure you make the most of the opportunities that are coming up. We've got group link coming up here at New Beginnings, August 17th on a Wednesday night. And just, hey, come join this move of God that we're getting to experience through this ministry. Amen? If you're not getting connected, you're missing out. You really are. You're missing out big time. You're missing out in a major way. So you want to get connected through serving. You want to get connected uh, through one of those uh, groups. Many of you that are here have been here the last few weeks. You know that we're not in a particular series today. But we're going through a, a series of standalone messages. And last week, I talked to you and I told you that I was going to be preaching on giving today. Woo! Hallelujah. Yeah. And, and you came back. So I warned you. I told you. So you came back. So you must want to hear it. And, and this is a very important topic. And this is what I want us to do today. Today we're talking about stepping up in our giving. Stepping up in our giving. You definitely don't want to go to a church that fails to preach about your finances. Let me tell you why you don't want to go to a church that's afraid to talk about money. One reason being is because Jesus talked about it through all throughout the Gospels, and he talked more about money than he did heaven and hell combined. So if you don't want to go to a church that talks about money, you wouldn't have went to Jesus' church. Y'all right this morning? And so it's important for us to talk about it. And the reason why Jesus talked about it so frequently and so often is because he knew your money would be your number one competitor for your heart. Amen. And so that's why he was constantly revisiting it and talking about it. He said where your treasure is, your heart, what is it? Your heart will be there also. And until Jesus is Lord over all aspects of your life, including your finances, He's not truly Lord of your life yet. Are you all right this morning? Amen. And by ceasing to relinquish your finances over to the hands of God, this is what you're saying. You're saying two things. Number one, you're saying the church is not important to you. Number two, you have yet to fully understand the sacrifice that Jesus paid for you on your behalf on the cross because it's through that generosity that we see on the cross that moves you and I to be generous to the church that he died for. Amen? Amen. So this isn't a money issue when we talk about you, you, you holding on to what God has called you to let go of. It's really bigger than that. It's a gospel issue. It's a good news. You haven't fully embraced the good news of Christ that Jesus died for you, that he rose for you, that he's offering eternal life to you and, and forgiveness of sin. And he, he can make all things good. You get to full. It's a gospel issue, not a money issue. And it's not, not just a gospel issue, but it's also a heart problem. And for you to go to that next level in your relationship with Christ. If you want to stay stuck, just keep doing what you're doing. But if you want to go to the next level in your relationship with Christ, you have to be willing to surrender that over to God. And so we want to give you an opportunity to do that today. That's my prayer for this church today. That's my prayer for your life. That you would step up in your giving. And as you do, as you do so, you will grow in your relationship with Christ. You will see God's faithfulness. You will see His blessing like never before. And at the same time as God's people steps up, this church will rise up and make a bigger difference than we ever thought was possible. Right? That's what it's all about. And then what I want to do, I want to talk to you about what it means to pay a price. We all know what it means to pay a price, amen? amen. There are certain things that have helped us learn on what it means to pay the price. For instance, this first picture, anytime, come on somebody, anytime you see blue and red lights in your rearview mirror, you know, depending on how many traffic violations you have violated, but you're about to pay a price, amen? amen. Oh, yeah. And sometimes it's a big price. How many in this room has paid the price 
because of the lights. Just raise your hand. Amen. Both hands go up. Amen. How many of you this last year have had to pay the price to the blue lights? Just raise your hand. Amen. Okay. Yeah. It's hard to get a ticket on the mountain, by the way. I got one and then never mind. I don't know how talk about it. Pull out the preacher card, you know? Oh, I'm a preacher. I'm going to minister to somebody. You know, you say, you say something like that. Get out of the cup. We all know what it's like to pay the price for something in our lives. Now, let's look at this next one. This is Disney, right? Now, now, when I went to Disney, Caleb and I went to Disney on the way back from our honeymoon, and the only reason why we went is because somebody gave us a free thing to go to Disney. And I didn't know how expensive that was, like 180 bucks a piece to get in the door to one little part of Disney. Like, you want to go to all the different kingdoms? That's like a grand, you know what I'm saying? And like, I didn't get the magical feeling when I went to Disney. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know how to feel in that kettle. I was like, oh, we were there for two hours. And the lines weren't even bad that day. I was just, the lines to me were bad. I don't have any context. Like, I didn't go when I was a kid. So, my wife, she got all these childhood memories. And, oh, man, we used to go here. I don't, I, listen, I'm in Silver Dollar City in Branson, Missouri. That's all I, that's all I knew. And then, in white water. That's all we knew. A little slip and slide. That's all we knew. And, and that's kind of how what my childhood was like. So I went there. This is what I realized when we walked in. This place is very expensive. <laughs> and, and how many of you brought your kids to this? Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. You brought your kids to this. You know that for every smile that you need to put on your kid's face, it's going to be at least $500. <laughs> and then, just to have breakfast with like... That the one of the one of the goofy living to like it's not even Mickey. It costs you like a grand. Are y'all right this morning? But what do you do? You pay the price of Disney because you love to see the smile on your kid's face. I'm sure when I have kids, take them to Disney and I'll be broke and go in debt and have to get a raise from the church. Amen. But we'll see how that works out. Now this next one is 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 before you have kids. This thing called getting married happens. It's not supposed to work, okay? You're supposed to do it that way. And that's a cute picture, isn't it? But guys, let me help you out. Once you cross the threshold of marriage, it's going to cost you something. Because your money is no longer your money. But it is your wife's money. Can I get a witness in the church today? You don't want, you no longer have, listen, you got 20 in your pocket, you got zero, your wife's got $20. Y'all with me this morning? Are you tracking with me? Oh, yeah. And fathers, fathers that have daughters, God bless you. I pray for you. Because that one day is going to affect your finances for the next 10 years. Amen. When your daughter gets married. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all still paying on that thing. So I just want to have one girl. No girls. Because I just can't pay the price. But you pay it. You pay the price because you love your daughter. You pay the price because you love your spouse. But no one, listen, don't miss this, no one knows better than what it means to pay the price than Jesus. Amen. No one knows better than what it means to sacrifice than Jesus Christ. Nobody knows better than what it means to pay the ultimate price. No one has ever paid a higher price than Jesus. No matter what you believe or where you are on the faith spectrum, you'd have a hard time arguing against the fact that Jesus is the most influential, most unique person that has ever walked the face of the earth. Amen? Nobody's influenced the world. And listen, nobody, you don't even, may not even know it yet, but nobody has influenced your life more than the sacrifice, the price, that Jesus was willing to pay. Amen. Isn't that what the Bible teaches in John 3, 16? And by the way, you can't read that verse without talking about giving. The most memorized verse, the most popular verse in all of Christianity, the most quoted verse, you can't talk about it without talking about giving. What does it say? For God so loved the world. Aren't you thankful this morning that God loves the world? He doesn't just love some of us. He just doesn't love the good people, the sort of bad people, but He loves the world. That means you, that means me, that means everybody who has ever lived that God loves us and He leaves nobody out. He loves everybody with the equal, unconditional, compassionate love 
But he didn't just say it, amen. He, he proved it. He displayed it by the price that he was willing to pray. He demonstrated his love for you and for the world through what he was willing, come on somebody, to give. For God so loved the world, watch, that he, let's say it together, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That word whoever there, I love that word whoever because that means it leaves nobody out. That means that no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done or what your reputation may be, that you're a whoever so you can come to faith in Christ and receive His forgiveness and receive His mercy and receive His grace and receive the new life that He has for you and most importantly, eternal life in heaven. Whoever. That word whoever means that everybody needs Jesus. Every person is true. You need Christ in your life. Whoever comes to Him in faith, whoever will believe in Him, shall not perish to have eternal life. What a powerful verse that is. Because God gave, we can have eternal life. Now they were talking about stepping up. Many times, in many areas, God will do something through His Word and He'll challenge you to step up to the next level. Have you ever been there before? He'll challenge you through His Word to step up to the next level. And when He does, it's important that we say yes to God. It's important that we step up because our ability to be able to step up, listen to this, will always make a difference in our life, but listen even better, it will make a difference in the lives of others as well. Your ability, when God speaks to you, when He challenges you, your ability to say, yes, God, I'll do it. Send me. Use me. I don't care if it's in my finances. I don't care if it's in the area of evangelism. I don't care if it's in the area of sacrificing my time. God, if you challenge me, I'm going to step up, and it's going to change your life. But more importantly, it's going to change lives around you like you never thought was possible. It's going to touch so many more people's lives than what you could ever possibly imagine in your mind. The way we make a difference, the way we change the world, is not by everybody sitting down in comfortable complacency and stagnant mediocrity. The way we change the world, the way we change our cities, the way we change our state, the way we change our community, is by stepping up when God calls us and rising to the challenge and becoming everything that He's called us to become. That's when we change the world, church. And if you want some of that, clap your hands. Hey, I'm ready for that. I'm ready to see this mountain change, but if, if we're going to step out into the community, we've got to step up in the church. That's my prayer for us today as new beginnings. And when it calls us the home you've been planted here, that you would experience everything that God has for you, that you would walk in His purpose, that you would see Him mighty and strong in every aspect of your life, that when He calls you, you step up, you do it, and you'll see God do more through your life than you ever thought was possible. And God wants us to have deep roots, amen? He wants us to have some deep roots. And deep roots result in producing fruit. I can't have fruit in my life that impacts the world if I don't have roots underneath. Because what's underneath, what you can't see, directly affects what you can't see. Amen. And so if I don't have deep roots, it's not theological knowledge. Deep roots is not understanding the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Deep roots does not come through knowledge alone. Deep roots, listen, it comes through obedience. It comes through hearing God's Word and doing God's Word. We're real good at hearing it every Sunday. We're real good at hearing what God is speaking, but we're really bad when it comes to doing God's Word. Amen. And so to have deep roots, I've got to hear it, and I've got to do it, and I've got to walk in it, and, and if I've got deep roots, then I'm going to have a flourishing life, but in order for that to happen, I've got to be obedient to God. And so when you have deep roots, you produce beautiful fruit. And when you have this, it doesn't matter, listen, because the reason why you need some deep roots, the reason why you need to be grounded, the reason why we see people flip-flop back and forth between Jesus and the world, listen, it's because they don't have roots. And you've got to have roots when the storm hits, amen? Because here, i got to tell you something. This may not be very encouraging today. The storm is coming. 
If it's not here, if you're not in it, it's on its way. There is a storm that's coming to your life. There's a trial. There's a tragedy that you cannot foresee. And for order, in order for you to stand strong and stand tall in the storm and the trials of your life, you've got to have some deep roots. Because if I've got some deep roots, it doesn't matter what comes against me. It doesn't matter what hell throws my way. If I'm rooted in the power of Christ and He's in me, it doesn't matter what comes against me. Amen? Amen. So i got to have some deep roots. And so, so I can go a little bit deeper today by stepping up in what God's called me to do. I want us to have deep roots. I want to have deep roots. I want to produce fruit that makes a difference. And so they were talking about giving. Listen, don't miss this. You're never more like Jesus than when you're giving. The goal in your life is to be like Christ. But listen, you will never be like Him if you can't learn to give. Because you are never, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave gospel. You are never, right now, you're never more like Jesus than when you're given. So, I know you're already tuning me out. You're like, man, I wasn't here last week when you had a little money talk and said you was going to preach on money today. Because if I would have known, I would have stayed home and I would have listened to Joel Osteen and got my ears tickled this morning. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Preacher talking about money. Here we go. Hide your kids, hide your wives, hide your birds. You're taking up everything up in here. Hide it there. He's coming for it. <laughs> Kind of like zipping up your purse and checking your wallet. Think we got you on the way in. Listen, it's, it's not about us getting your money. It's about God getting your heart. Because if your wallet still has your heart, how can God have it? And by the way, I don't, we don't need your money. If you think we're trying to get your money, keep it. Because God will provide for us whether you give it or someone else. That's does. right. Amen. I've learned that over the last five years. Amen. I've been the pastor of this church. Since day one, in the first building that we built, I realized I can't trust in those that give. I can't trust in the giving reports. I can't trust in the big checks. i got to trust in my God because He is the owner of it all. And if I can trust in Him, He'll purse your heart. He'll purse their heart. And people will relinquish their finances. So I just got i got to trust in God because I know God is going to meet our needs. Amen. This building is a testimony. Amen. That God will meet your needs if you'll be faithful and if you'll pray to Him and seek Him, He'll meet your needs. Amen. So all I'm going to do, I want to share a passage of Scripture with you where we see an incredible act of generosity. It's in John chapter 12. Go ahead and find your way there in John chapter 12. And we're going to begin reading in verse 1. In the Gospel of John, John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And he writes about this event that transpired, but he writes about it in a very unique perspective. And I, I want to read it from through his eyes and through the lens that, that he saw it in comparison to the other gospel writers. Listen to what he says in verse 1. Matter of fact, chapter 11 talks about when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but Jesus can make the dead alive again. That's powerful, amen? There's nobody else that can do that. Amen. Six days before the Passover, watch this. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. What's your problem this morning? What's your burden this morning? What has you down today that you feel like you can never get past and that God can never fix? Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Let that be encouraging to you. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, watch this, while Lazarus it was among those reclining at the table with him. He was dead like a day ago. Now they're chilling at the table eating. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> like he took a bath by now. He showered. Because you remember he kind of was stinking it said. In John chapter 11. Because the body had been dead for a couple days. And you know. And so he showered. He's clean. And they're chilling at the table. It's just kinda, they would kind of lean back at the table. Jesus was cool. He was kind of lean. And chilled at the table. <laughs> Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard. Nard just sounds like grease or something, but it's not. It's an expensive perfume. And she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped 
His feet with her hair. Not only is this an extravagant picture of generosity, this is an extravagant picture of worship. And you know that when you give to the church, you know what it is? It's an act of worship to your God. That worship isn't just when we're singing and when we're preaching, but worship is when we're writing a check and putting it in the bucket and we're giving. And it says this, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I want you to remember that phrase. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak to us in a mighty personal way. God, I am so abundantly aware of my desperate need for you this morning. And God, would you speak through me for Christ's sake. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now when we look at this act of worship, when we look at this sacrifice, this act of generosity, we later find out that this perfume that she had put on the feet of Jesus was actually worth a year's worth of wages. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. This perfume that she just poured on the feet of Jesus, wiped her hair all in, it was kind of that sound was worth a year's worth of wages. Now think about what that means for you, okay? Think about what that would mean for you. We all make different you know, amounts of money throughout the month, throughout the week. Think about what that would mean for you. That you would take a year's worth of your wages and just lay it at the feet of Jesus. That's what we just saw in the Scripture. Good thing. Woo! I don't know if I can get on that level of giving. And I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, sister. Think about that. That's some amazing generosity, amen? amen. Can we all agree that that's some, that's some sacrifice? Come ahead and shake with me. That's some generosity. That's, that's big time. That's a year's worth of wages. None of us in this room could imagine possibly giving that much. And here's the thing about generosity. When people saw the generosity of this woman, it moved most of the people. There was one guy named Judas that started complaining about what she did. Keep reading. He's like, what about the poor? What's God? <laughs> Y'all built this building. Y'all ain't feeding the poor out there. You're just like Judas. <laughs> exactly what Judas said. How about we build a building and fill it with people who relinquish their finances so then we can go out and feed the hungry? Are y'all alright this morning? Amen. Don't be like Judas today. Don't be like Judas. Keep reading. You'll see what Judas said. Generosity moves us. When we saw Jesus hanging on the cross just a few moments ago, that moves us, amen? amen. That Jesus, who was nothing like us, who we were enemies of because of our sin and His holiness, that He would actually come down to this earth and die for us and bleed for us and suffer for us, that moves your heart, doesn't it, church? Amen. Generosity moves people. Like, you remember that show, Extreme Home Makeover? Anybody ever watch Extreme Home Makeover? You know what I'm talking about? And it was Ty with the raspy voice and the spiky hair. You know, they feel like a man like, yeah, hey, he's crazy. Like he was always like drinking too much caffeine. And he would go into a needy family that was in need and their stories would always touch your heart. Like, you know, they're going through cancer, they lost a kid, or, or they, you know, they're trying to put their kids through school or something, you know, something was going on, there was a big need. And he would go in and he would basically give them the house of their dreams. And when it would get to the very end, they'd literally do it like in a week's time. And Kayla and I, we would watch this. Listen, we would watch like a season a day. Because this has been out for a while. So we got like watch a season a day. And I remember, listen, when they get the chick and move that bus, move that bus, move that bus, and they move the bus, and you see this big, beautiful home, and the people are crying, and the kids are crying. I just got to be honest with you, as a grown man, little tears started streaming down my face. Don't laugh at me. You cry too. And my wife said, I just can't take it. I can't take it. I can't take it. <laughs> you know? Why is that? Generosity moves us. Now, if that was called Extreme Home Kick Your Butt Out of the House, somebody wants to watch that. That's terrible, right? Come in and kick your butt out of the house on the street. Nobody wants to watch that because that's not generous. The reason why the show was so great, the reason why so many people wanted to watch the show was because of the overwhelming generosity that was displayed. Giving always moves our hearts. Listen, when you give to church, the church 
that Jesus died for, the church that Jesus is leading, the church that Jesus is the head of, the church that Jesus is sustaining, you can know that what you're giving to is really making a difference and having an impact for the kingdom of God. Because here's what I know about whenever you give your money out. You don't complain when you give it to Walmart. You don't complain when you give it to Amazon. You don't complain when you give it to United Way. Come on, somebody. You just, you just let go of it real quick, right? When it's something that, that can bless you. But, but listen, all of those organizations, what they do will only matter on this side of heaven. Hear me. What the church does will matter for eternity. The next thousand years, the next five thousand years, the next ten thousand, the next hundred thousand years, the church will still be moving forward. And you can say, I got to be a part of it when I was alive. And I was like, David, I got to fulfill my purpose during the time that I was on this earth. I got to invest in something that outlived my life. Amen. Eternal significance. You get the greatest return. When you get to the church that Christ died. Now what I want to do, I want to talk about three levels of giving. Three levels of giving. The first level is where you start. We're going to kind of get higher and higher as we go. Three levels of giving. The first level is tithing. Everybody clap your hands if you're excited about tithing. About ten of you. Tithing is no test of principle. We're under grace. Well, let me tell you about under grace in the New Testament. You won't even see this level of giving in the New Testament. Because they give on a much higher level than this level. The Pharisees gave on this level. And we always said, if the Pharisees can give 10 under the law under grace, we certainly can do better. But this is where you start, Amen. In the New Testament, you don't hear about it because they give above and beyond that. But if you're going to start giving, this is where you start. Tithing is very simple. Listen, it's me returning back to God what He's already placed in my hand. It's me returning back to God 10% of my income back to Him. He put it in my hands. Now God just wants me to put 10% back in His hands. That's what tithing is. Now listen to me. Don't miss this. 94% of Christians do not do this. I can share the statistics of the difference that the churches can make in America if those 94% start giving. Listen, notice this. This is what I've noticed since I've been in ministry. This is the number one problem that holds Christians back from living a dynamic Christian life. This is the number one problem. This is the one thing that so many people just can't get past in their walks with Christ. You know what's amazing to me? People who know their Bible, people who have been in ministry, you know, I know pastors that don't even tithe. If you're on staff here and you don't tithe, you'll get fired. Boom, like that, in an instant. <laughs> he ties, he ties. And I'm thinking to myself, how do you expect God to bless your church? If you're not even obeying in the, in the most fundamental way as a Christian, as a, are you kidding me? You know your Bible. You know what Jesus taught. You know about ministry. You know the importance of giving to the kingdom. And you're still, you're still not giving biblically and faithfully. Are you, are you crazy? I want to say stupid, but I'm not going to be so weak <laughs> And they wonder why their church never grows. They wonder why they never break free financially. And they wonder why they stay stuck their whole life in their relationship with God. They wonder why they're not fully satisfied in Christ. You know why you're having a satisfaction problem? It's because you're still drawing satisfaction from what you can give yourself. And He's got to be the source of our satisfaction. Amen? Amen. It's the bottom rung level of giving in the first century church. It wouldn't even be considered a sacrifice. They would take it, I'm sure. They'd say, hey, it's kind of weak. You might want to. Because they get everything. You don't want to talk about the New Testament giving. You don't even want to go there. And by the way, the tithe was, before, was hundreds of years before the law ever came into existence. I could, throw, I could throw eight verses at you real quick before the law was ever instituted that they tithe. I could talk all about it. I'm not going to get into all that. You can. You can look it up and read it for yourself. I know some of you are saying, you're saying, you know what? I believe in giving 10%, but I kind of chop mine up a little bit. 
I get five here, I get two here, I get two over here. Listen, I can make a strong biblical case. I'm not going to get into it today. You can hear other sermons online that I preached a year ago. The series, The Church Just Wants Your Money series. You can look at all this. I can make a strong biblical case. All of the tithe is to go to the church. The local body. And if you can't get here, find a church that you can get to. Find a church that you can get faithfully to. Listen, your relationship is more important than our attendance here. This is what you do. You say, well, you know what? God's leading me in a different direction. I think God's leading me to start giving here and giving here. Listen, God would never lead you away from the church that His Son died for. Am I preaching this morning? Are y'all are y'all grabbing this? Are y'all picking up what I'm laying down today? And so God says, give back the ten percent. Give it off the top. It's the principle of first fruits. Give give to God before you give to the cable company. Before you pay your rent. Before you do all those things. Let it let it go straight go straight there and watch God provide for the rest. God says, if you will put me first, I'll bless you. Remember Malachi chapter three. He says, if you're not giving to, to the storehouse and tithes and offerings, you're under a financial curse. Some of you are coming to me and praying, would you pray that God would give me a better job and more money? I can't pray for God to bless a curse. And the only way for that curse to get reversed is by you being obedient and stepping up in your giving. And what do I want to do? I want to give you a picture of this principle. I want Nathan to come up here. Nathan has no idea what we're about to do up here. And I hope he plays along well. I think he will. Because I think even a teenager can understand this. Oh my goodness, can I preach? He's going to be 60, you can't get it. He's going to get it, he's a teenager. I want to show us a picture to help us to kind of remember what we're talking about today. Now, what I, what I have up here, and some of you type A personalities have been wondering, what the oh, Lord's name has he got up here? <laughs> what I have up here are 10 of the most heavenly chocolate chip cookies you've ever seen in your life. Everybody look at it. Everybody look at it. Look. <laughs> These are Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Chocolate chip. And if you've never been to Chick-fil-A, I strongly question your salvation. <laughs> Christian chicken, amen? And these right here are the best chocolate chip cookies you'll ever taste. And you're just salivating at the mouth. Because it's Sunday. And you can't go to Tullahoma and get them because it's Sunday. And they're closed on Sunday because they're so committed to God. Now, Nathan, I've got, I've got 10 cookies here, okay? And some of y'all, listen, some of y'all need to get off the mountain once in a while. <laughs> some of y'all, listen, you ain't been off the mountain in 10 years. God bless you. If you need to get up off the mountain and go down in the valley and see Chick-fil-A and see Buffalo Wild Wings and see restaurants, amen? You need to see some of that, okay? It will bless you. There's more than Papa Ron's, amen? <laughs> now, I love Papa Ron's. It's my go-to, but there's so much more if you'll just get off the mountain. And they've not got 10 cookies here. And what I'm going to do with these 10 cookies, and these are marvelous right here. How many of you would say, I'd like to have 10 cookies? I'd like to have them. Just be honest. Just be honest. Now, Nathan, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you all 10 of these cookies. But before, <laughs> before I give them to you, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to just give one of them back. Can you do that? Or you will. Listen, you're still going to have... Listen, do you have any cookies on you? I'd be worried if you did. No cookies? <laughs> listen, when he walked in today, he had no cookies. I am the source of his cookies. Amen? I am your provider of your cookies. You cannot have any cookies right now in this moment unless I give these cookies to you. So will you do well? I give you ten? Will you give me one back? Just give me one back. Thank you. <laughs> now he still has nine cookies, amen? Do you know that's what God is asking you to do with your finances? Ten cookies. Listen, he's got ten cookies. God just wants to give you, listen, ten percent of what he's given you, which would be one cookie. God puts ten dollars in your hand. You know all he wants? So just give him one dollar back. God puts a thousand, he wants to put a hundred dollars. Now that's the time, right? Now some of you, listen, you will trust God with your eternity, and you will trust God with your salvation, but you won't trust God with your money. Can I say that there must be a problem right there? Amen. 
And it's not that God wants to take something from us. God wants something for us. He wants to show His faithfulness. He wants to bless us and do things that we never thought God could ever do. Because the reality is, if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have anything this morning, church. Amen. You wouldn't have the clothes on your body. You wouldn't have the home that you're going to go home to. You wouldn't have the food in your belly. You wouldn't have the air in your lungs if it wasn't for the mercy and the grace of God. So out of my, out of my gratitude for how gracious you've been to me, God, I'm going to at least give you 10% back of what you've graciously given to me. Amen. Come on, back your hands. It's the least I can do, God. It's the least I can do. That's what the title is. Amen? Now, number two, I'll come for your goodness. <laughs> number two, we've got offerings. Now, offerings, what offerings is, is anything that you give above and beyond your tithe. So now you have nine cookies, Nathan. Now listen, if you will give me two cookies back, you've already given me one, if you give me two cookies, not only will I bless you more today, but I'll bless a lot of people today. You willing to give me two more? See how quick you did that? That's fast. You didn't think that because you trust me, right? I'm a preacher. I ain't in a lot of church, right? Have I ever lied to you before? I'll fix it. You ain't caught me yet. By the way, this is a thousand calories right here in my head. So I'll give you a stroke. Amen? You know that giving comes down to trust. It's a trust issue. You know what you're telling God when you're not giving? I just don't trust you, God. I just don't trust you. Trust Him with heaven. You trust Him with your marriage. You trust Him with your kids. But won't trust Him with your wallet. Now, an offering is when we give above and beyond the tithe. We've got things like Kingdom Come Offering that are coming up in November that we give above and beyond. We do extra ministry with. Listen, we've got, we've got a huge ministry project coming up in September that we won't be able to do well unless you step up and you're giving. Now, number three, the next level, I'm coming to the goodness, man. The next level is extravagant giving. Now, he's got seven cookies left. Now, let's just imagine that these seven cookies that he has, and these are all very plump and nice and beautiful. Imagine that this is his entire net worth. We're living in a cookie economy. You have no money. This is your entire net worth right here. And listen, if you will give me, now listen, if you'll give me four more cookies, I know it's hard, but listen, listen, if you'll give me four more cookies, you'll still have some left that you didn't have at all. But if you'll give me four more cookies, listen, I will bless you so big today it will blow your mind. And listen, I will bless every person in this room and in the kids' rooms. Everybody will leave here blessed. Hold on, hold on. Should he do it, church? Amen. Maybe you should do it. Maybe you should do it. All right. You going to do it? You only need three anyway. Amen. <laughs> you hear that? Man, I wish we thought the same way about money. Amen. Wow, that's good stuff. Now, this is what I want to do for Nathan. Give it up for Nathan, by the way. <laughs> Nathan, you can take those three cookies. And I've got a complete cookie tray from Chick-fil-A that you can take with you, too. And share with your friends. Give it up for Nathan. Come on. Now listen, not only is he leaving with a cookie tray today, but every single person in this room and every single kid in the kids' ministry, on your way out, you will get one free cookie coupon to Chick-fil-A. Come on, give God some praise for this place. You can't go and get the cookie. I know some of y'all bless God, Chick-fil-A. I don't go down the mountain and bless the Lord. Chick-fil-A, what in the world is that? I knew some of y'all would say that. So not only are you going to get a free cookie, you can take Chick-fil-A, but also you're going to get a free chocolate frosty at Wendy's on the mountain, down the street. Come on, somebody. Get up to play. Now listen to what I want you to do with those two coupons. <coughs> we want you to be generous this week. So instead of keeping both of them for yourself, I want you to take one of those coupons. Bless God, I don't go down the mountain. We'll give that one away, sweetheart. <laughs> and put it with a little sit with me invite card that's out there on the information table. And I want you to take one of those coupons and take one of those cards and be generous this week. Bless God, I'm on a diet. 
<laughs> Why didn't he give out salads today? <laughs> I'm offended if he didn't give out salads. Here, here, sweetheart, give both of them away. It'll probably be the most generous thing you've ever done. <laughs> I'm just saving your life. <laughs> Boom! Drop the mic, walk off the stage. <laughs> Now here's what I'm going to challenge you to do today. This is the challenge. Find whatever level you're on right now and step up to the next level. Step up to the next level. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm not a tither and I've never really done it before. Listen, we want to make it easy for you. We want you to commit to giving for 90 days. Every one of your seats had a 90 day giving challenge card when you walked in. You can fill that out and you can start giving. And you're just committing. You're not committing your own life. You're just committing for 90 days. And listen, by the end of that 90 days, at any time during that 90 days, you fall into financial hardship, we will give you every dime back of your money. Money back guarantee. Because not only do I believe you're not going to fall into financial hardship, but listen, I believe God is going to do what He says He's going to do and open the floodgates of heaven and pour a blessing into your life that's so big that you can't even contain it. Amen. I'm just trusting God. See, I'm going to take the 90-day giving challenge. Every seat has one of those. You can begin filling it out now. If you're already tithing, listen, up your percentage a few, a few points. So Kayla and I are going to be going over the next, next 90 days. In November, go ahead and start preparing yourself for the Kingdom Come offering. September, right before we go to two services, we're doing two huge outreaches. And in order for us to do them well, we've got to be willing to step up today. Are you all right this morning? Some of you have the ability to give extravagant offerings. Some of you have the ability to write a big check and help us pay this building off. Because when we get this building paid off, we can go play another one in another city. And when we get that one paid off, we can play another one in another city and keep on sharing what God is doing here with the world. Amen? And so you've got that. You've got that blessing. You can do that. Listen, there's no greater investment in the church. If you find a greater investment in the church, tell me about it. I'll give my life to you. I'll give my finances to you. I'll lay out my life for you. And listen, if you've given over the last four years, listen to this. I was looking at numbers this week. We've seen over 300 people give their lives to Christ in the last four years of being in the church. Wow. We have baptized nearly 100 people. Come on, somebody. We've grown from 7 people to 150 in average attendance. We're changing our city. I Amen. Mean, we're seeing that happen. We dreamed it. We envisioned it. We're seeing it. We're seeing the mountain change. We're seeing this community change. And we want to see the state change. We want to see the world change. So we're stepping up today. Amen. Amen. we got to keep going. We can't stop. We can't slow down. we got to keep going further. There, there's so many people out there that we've yet to touch, that we've yet to reach. We've got to be willing to step up. Let me ask you, will you step up today? You step up today so that we can continue to make a difference. We just added two huge ministries to our church, our youth ministry and our Celebrate Recovery ministry. Two of the biggest things we have are vans right now. We think, listen to this. There are people that will come here on Sunday mornings and come Sunday nights and come Friday nights, but they have no transportation. We, we can't, we, have, we don't have any room in our vehicles to bring them. Everybody's already maxed out. Listen, we get vans. People that are still lost can come and hear the gospel and be saved because you gave. You'll step up today. You'll step up these next 90 days. By the end of those 90 we'll have names in this church. See how serious it is? Are you making the connection with your giving and your generosity and lives that can be changed? We want to bless the needy in our community. We're doing a huge outreach to bless the needy in our community. You know, listen, the more people that step up today, the more people we will bless in September. It all comes down to that. Because until we step up, until we're obedient, until we say, yes, God, I'm ready. Until we step up in here as a church, we can't step out into the community. It starts in here. It starts with us. Ask yourself, do I need to step up? What level am I in? Where do I need to step up? You can start filling out that card right now. I encourage you to do so. Drop off and y'all can play at the end of the service. Listen, 
you will not be disappointed. I promise you, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. You will see God's faithfulness. I guarantee you. You give in the name of Jesus, as we just saw, what God only well, we saw it because it's God wants to do with your life. As we talk about being generous, we talk about being moved by generosity. The greatest act that's ever moved us is the cross. Amen. And looking at that bloodstained cross and seeing Jesus hang on the cross and seeing what he sacrificed and seeing the price that he paid for you and for me, it tells you and I, listen, listen, it moves us to be generous as well. That's the gospel. God's been so good to each and every one of us, hasn't he? He's been so gracious to us. If he never gave us another thing, he's already given us his son. This one and only Son He gave, that whoever will believe in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. So I'm going to ask if we can close our eyes and bow our heads. I'm going to pray for us. Give you time to fill out those cards. And I want to I speak to you today. Listen, maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? Today is the first time I realize that Jesus died for me and that Jesus loves me. And seeing that sacrifice that he made, that ultimate price that he was willing to pay for me, it makes me want to give my life to him. If that's you, listen, if that's you, I want to give you a way to call upon his name to be saved right now in this place. And you can start the greatest journey, the greatest life that you ever thought you could live. That's you. You know you need to give your life to Christ. Today is your day. Would you give it to him now? Pray with me now. That's you. Dear God. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin separates me from you. God, today, I ask that you would forgive me. I ask that you would change me. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he rose from the grave. Today, I trust in you with all of my life. I trust in you with my salvation. God, I promise to live for you for the rest of my life. But God, I need your help. So I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me from the inside out. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed. You just pray with me out loud. As I prayed out loud, you prayed softly. You just shoot your hand up at me. Shoot up high. 